My avian human race, the Quellian, spend nine months of the year on migration. While they travel, they carry very few possessions, but they need some kind of shelter. Quellians sleep in tents called bateaux. A bateau framework is made from simple poles of a plant found growing wild on the plains called cane grass. It is a bit like bamboo, though it only grows to six or seven foot in height. It tends to grow near creeks and springs, which is handy, because searching for clumps of cane grass from the air can help a flock to find sources of water and good campsites. The canes are lashed together with ropes of twisted grass. The frame of a traditional family bateau is six-sided and flat-topped. It is covered with a tarp made of leather hides, and pegs are nailed into the ground to stabilize the structure. Weight is an important factor in Quellian life, and all of their possessions must be worth carrying. The leather of their bateau covering is the heaviest and most costly thing they own. One wall operates as a door flap, and during the day it can be raised with other canes to make a shade canopy. Inside the bateau, Quellian have little furniture. A mat woven of grass might be placed at the entrance. They sleep on furs. They usually don't carry blankets. If they get chilly at night, they simply wrap up in their own wings. They might have a couple of folding stools, simple wooden frames with a leather sling for the seat, and a bag or two of their clothing, tools, and personal items. Bateaux do come in other shapes and sizes. A single person without a family to share with might have a simple triangular setup, with a bateau only large enough to crouch inside the entrance or stretch out for sleep. This minimalist configuration is especially popular for flock hoppers, who might need to carry their own bateau unassisted while journeying between flocks. All bateaux are small, but that works for the quellian. They spend their waking hours outside during migration and only need a tent large enough for the family to curl up inside to sleep or take shelter in if it's a rainy spring day. And so the additional weight it would cost to make it larger just isn't worth carrying. But what about the other three months of the year? What sort of homes do Quellian winter in? A winter bateau is shaped almost the same as a traditional tent, but it is far larger. The entire flock shares a single bateau when in town. This is one reason why establishing a new flock is such an extreme challenge. They will need to spend months building their bateau while simultaneously hunting and preparing for winter. To build a bateau, first you must dig a pit. This will form a sublevel, which will be used as a root cellar and as storage for the flock's possessions too heavy to carry on migration. Solid beams of wood are positioned upright in the pit and anchored with horizontal beams at the base, ground level, and ceiling. These planks must be flown in all the way from the Jade Mountains or from the edge of Grey Territory. Six ceiling beams are brought together at the center, and a door frame is added. Then a wood flooring is built across the ground level. While the wooden structure is being built, stone and river clay are dug up and packed in around the wood, to protect it from the moisture of the earth. This stonework forms a flooring and walls in the sublevel, but the stone is built up above the ground to roughly hip height, and around the door frame. This stone probably varies by town. Kinhei would probably use local red rocks, and Kinthiji would probably use granite and metamorphic stone formed by the pressure of the mountains rising. Kinyistin might trade with the Aegeans for some of their local orange bricks, and the other three probably use simple river stones. Of course, this is still the underground view. Let's check what the bateau would look like above ground at this stage. An important thing to remember is that while the hunters and their children will only live in this bateau during the winter, the elders of the flock will live in it year-round, so it needs to be functional for both weather extremes. With this in mind, the rest of the walls are filled by a thin lattice, woven from narrow strips of reed and quills. This lattice allows in light and fresh air during the summer, but helps to keep the larger forms of pestilence at bay. The roof is made from a massive tarp, pieced together from dozens and dozens of hides. It must be regularly maintained, checked for cracks, and rubbed with tallow or beeswax to keep it watertight. The sides of the bateau are also draped with tarps. They are usually pulled back to the side during the summer, but they can be drawn closed and tied down during rainy weather. To winterize the bateau, the flock will hang their own tarps from the inside of the walls, and the gap between the tarps and the lattice will be packed tight with dry grass. The doorway will be hung with a curtain of feathers in the summer to minimize the insects. The door is another sheet of leather and will be drawn to the side during the day and pulled taut and tied down at night. But what does the inside look like? How is a bateau furnished? The sublevel is accessed through an opening in the floor and a ladder. It will be stockpiled with jars of food, shelving, baskets, and rafters hung with dried goods. The cellar also houses the flock's possessions, their winter clothes, toys, mementos, and other items too costly to transport during the summer. Upstairs, the bateau will be heated with a clay stove, placed roughly in the center of the room. It is quite small, as the quillian cook outside or in communal kitchen bateaus, and only need this stove for heat. At night, families and singles nest down with furs. There is no real privacy, and very few children are born during the months of autumn. There would also be more stools and benches. 
Quillian prefer backless seating to account for their wings. Molted feathers are kept and often tied to the rafters and the walls until they are needed. I think the ceiling beams would be utilized for the fledglings. Their parents would probably hang poles and ladders and hammocks and nets and ledges and platforms, transforming the warm, empty ceiling into a place for the children to climb up and get some space in the close quarters of a full bateau during the stifling months of winter. When the hunters clear out for the summer and take their crazy children with them, the elders do a bit of housekeeping, returning the hunters' possessions to the sublevel and spreading out their own furs a bit. I think the elders love it when their flock returns home, but they also breathe a small, secret sigh of relief every time spring comes again. Let's talk a little bit about geography. The Quellian inhabit a portion of a prairie. I'm working with someone on Discord to figure out the exact radius, mass, gravity, and surface area of the planet Teom. Once we align that with my continent and the projected equator and pole, we will be able to calculate the exact area in miles that their land covers. Then I'll be able to calculate the sustainability and use that to get a close estimation of exactly how large the Quellian population is. But that will need to come later. For now, I do know that there are at least six winter towns. Each of the six towns represents a portion of land they consider their territory, hunting grounds for the flocks belonging to that town. These territories have each developed a slightly different culture, influenced by geography and their neighbors. This isn't something I've explored to a great extent yet, but I do know a few things. Kintin, home of the Goldens, is the largest winter town and has the most diversity, in terms of a nearly even mix of colorations. It is located at the center of the prairie, so it is thought to be the safest, and many flock hoppers are encouraged to go there first if they insist on leaving their home territory. Anyone traveling across the whole expanse of the plains will end up visiting the Goldens. Goldens and other Quellian from Kintin are stereotyped as sunny, fun-loving, and carefree, possibly because their home is the most insulated from outside concerns. Kin Hei, home of the Scarlets, has a large territory, but it is the smallest of the original six winter towns. It is located in the northeast, bordering the desert. The land in Scarlet territory is drier and less abundant the closer to the desert you range, grass giving way to red rocks. Kin Hei has a limited water source, and the growth of the town was stunted in consequence. Scarlet territory has the largest percentage of its population still the original coloration, as not many Quellian except the Scarlets who grew up there decide to stay in such dry territory. Scarlets are stereotyped as passionate and intense. They have few lions to worry about, but they do have to contend with large constrictor snakes. And so, it is quite common for them to wear slim snake fangs in their ears instead of lion fangs. Moving north, Kinyistin, home of the Blacks, is moderately sized. The most notable thing about Black territory is that it borders Aegea. The Aegeans are farmers inhabiting the northern half of the plains and age-old neighbors of the Quillian. Aegeans are quite friendly, and the farmers living near the border have well-established trading ties with the Black Quillian. Because of this, Blacks have much more knowledge of the outside world than most other Quellian, as well as access to more metal tools and other technology. Blacks are stereotyped as businesslike and serious, and are thought to make good yinintes. Kinyas, home of the Greys, is quite large compared to the size of its territory. It is situated at the edge of the Great River in the northwest, and the growth has not been limited by water supply. Greys hunt the same as all Quellian, but they also do quite a lot of fishing. Most Quellian cannot and do not swim, but Greys think it's important to teach their children. The Great River also leads to the ocean, and so Grey territory is a popular stop for flock hoppers who want to see the edge of the world. Greys are stereotyped as tending towards pessimism and gloominess, perhaps because they often have heavy brows and deep set eyes. Greys also tend to be the tallest of the Quillian. Not by a lot, but a noticeable amount. Kinthiji, home of the Silvers, is quite interesting and very different from the other five winter towns. For one, it is the only town not situated on flat prairie land. It is built at the snowy peaks of the Jade Mountains in the southwest. Silver Quellian hunt along the mountainside, and their territory covers only a narrow strip of grassland along the Jade Mountains. The culture of Silver territory is quite distinct from the others. Silvers have access to trees and wood to make bows and furnitures and bateaus. They also have access to chert and obsidian and other stone good for making arrowheads and hunting knives. This gives them an advantage over the other territories, and something almost like an economy. There is a subtle divide between Silvers and the other Quillian, who stereotype them as sensitive and fragile. There might be some ancient bad blood between them, and resentment among the Quillian over their reliance on trade with the Silvers. Historically, Silvers also had contact with Nauticans, particularly the River Nauticans over the Jade Mountains. The Nauticans did have an influence on Silver culture. Their aesthetic their language, their thinking, and the goods available for trade. Silvers are the only Quillian subculture to have a significantly different accent. And finally, in the southeast, we have Kinhakis, home of the Browns, who are stereotyped as easygoing and down-to-earth. 
Kenhakis is moderately sized, but brown territory now borders Inosi-occupied land, and a portion of their territory has become a no-man's land between them. Most of the stories I've worked on having to do with Quelian have centered around Kinhakis, so it's the town I'm most familiar with. I tried mapping it out once, and though it was just a rough idea, I think the town from the air would look sort of like this, having spread out very naturally as flocks grew too large and split, and more and more bateaus were added to the existing town, giving it an organic, chaotic lack of city planning. Like most Quellian towns, Kinhakis was built along a river. At some point in the past, outsiders were brought in to install pipes and plumbing to carry water from the river to spigots throughout town. Bathhouses and toilets were even built, though some of these have begun to fall into disrepair since the borders were closed. The center of Kinhakis is the oldest, with bateaus that have probably been there since the last time Shikoba visited. There is the healing bateau, and the kitchen bateaus and crafting bateaus where the elders spend their days. There is a huge courtyard where festivals and ceremonies and dances are held. There is a bateau housing the painted skulls of particularly noteworthy Yinintes from Kulian history. Another large area is built like a playground, though it is much more dangerous than any human playground. And I'm sure Kinhakis holds many other secrets that I've yet to explore. I think Kinhakis and the other winter towns would be very eerie to visit in the summer, almost like a cross between a retirement home and a ghost town, inhabited by only a sparse, mostly elderly population. But at the end of autumn, when the flocks begin to flood in, the atmosphere would reverse, being almost like Thanksgiving and Christmas and your birthday all at once. All of the life, thousands of people, the children greeting their grandparents, and families from different flocks reuniting. There would certainly be holidays and feasts, as everyone prepared to bundle up for another winter, and pray it might be short so that they can get back out into the air.